<clears throat> so as we spoke uh, earlier on, um, we'll be uh, looking into these basic uh, steps that we need uh, in order to take uh, to the much bigger steps that we take. That's the, um, first we talked about a lot of things, um, how we create these things, how uh, we can manage a, a simple application and how we can de uh, deploy these things using um, most modern uh, deployment strategies like Docker. Okay, so of course, uh, without uh, containerization, we can also deploy our application. There are other options as well. But uh, in the modern age, uh, due to the demand of uh, scaling and how we can manage uh, the application, so this is kind of the de facto these days. Okay, it might change in the future, or sometimes some organization might prefer the um, old ways. But um, in, with, uh, within the current situation and current organizational structures and how they use um, the um, deployment strategies, this is kind of like a normal thing that you would see every day. Okay, so um, as mentioned, uh, we'll be uh, we'll be taking a lot of uh, these. Um, um, uh, CICD, we will be using the uh, Docker image builds in most of the time CICD pipelines. Okay, so if you if you have a, a requirement on such a case, okay, uh, if, if you guys can remember, we looked at uh, GitHub Actions. Okay, I mean, uh, with using GitHub Actions, what we could do is we can simply say, okay, when we are when we are done with our changes, when we push it. Uh, the deployment is al almost done. So those kind of thing um, really help us with uh, what we are doing uh, with the deployment of our application. So Docker is one of the way that we can ship our products uh, into the uh, uh, into the uh, CI/CD pipeline. Okay. So next thing that uh, we would be talking uh, is um, I think I have I have given you guys some reference. Uh, to look upon, um, which is like uh, the uh, basics of um, scaling our application. When we are scaling applications, how we gonna use um, uh, the, um, um, the available tools that we can use to uh, scale up uh, the deployment. So yes, we were able to uh, uh, yeah, we were able to uh, deploy a uh, application uh, using Docker. We can just simply say Docker run, and the application would simply run, right? So, um, but in reality, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Of course, uh, uh, for small applications, uh, if you are having one uh, one application, yeah, it might come like. Uh, 100,000 users or whatever the server can handle. Uh, this kind of uh, deployment pattern, uh, Docker-based deployments would uh, be sufficient for you. We can use Docker Compose even uh, to uh, come up with those uh, all the solutions, but uh, sometimes it is not always the case that uh, we, we, would, uh, we would be doing such a thing. So we might need, um, um, some things uh, like scaling okay why do we need scaling well the biggest uh, issue with uh, the biggest uh, problem why we need scaling is the user traffic so think uh, think of reason or think a situation where you have an app okay it's working perfectly it can manage up to like uh, uh, x amount of users but all of a sudden, your app get uh, popular or your web service is gaining more attraction from the community or from the internet. What they do is they will um, access the service frequently, okay? Or maybe they will uh, have a lot of uh, things um, to be um, worked with. So in a scenario like that, what will happen is uh, we, um, the basic, um, basic traffic that we are getting 
is gonna um, it's not gonna suffice uh, it's not gonna be enough or sufficient to handle all the requests so in 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 a scenario like where you can't handle all the requests there are two things that can happen okay the first thing is um, all of a sudden the request payload is too much too many people are accessing the server can't handle it anymore uh, server might go out of memory or out of CPU or yeah, the worst case is can lead it to a server crash. The server would crash and what will happen is uh, it, uh, we, we, won't be, uh, we won't be able to uh, serve a one single customer because if the server is crashed, if the server is restarting, you can't do anything in, in a scenario like that. Your server will restart, your application will go down. Okay, that is one thing that can happen. The other thing that you can do is um, the other thing that you you would probably see that it's uh, called uh, what we call uh, the application uh, might uh, be able to uh, scale up. Okay, that means if um, if we have configured the software or the service in a correct way. You don't have to like um, uh, you don't have to like uh, die out or you you don't need to um, shut it down. It it is scaling up. If we can handle uh, hundred people using one single server or one single node, if we double the server uh, server uh, server capacity, say for instance we have two instances now. What will happen is um, we can handle 200 users likewise it's not going to be like one-to-one -one scale but sometimes it's depending on the traffic it might go up it might go down but um, in in a nutshell uh, it uh, it will uh, give us the opportunity to handle more request or handle more customers so uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, write our application in a more scalable manner okay so scaling is one of the most important thing when you think about an application okay so there are like a lot of scaling mechanisms out there okay how you can scale so uh, we normally uh, divide scaling into two uh, different uh, types okay so the first first type that uh, we would do is uh, we would go with um, horizontal scaling okay uh, we have a scaling mechanism or scaling uh, type called horizontal scaling and we have uh, vertical uh, scaling uh, uh, so um, in in uh, um, uh, in uh, vertical scaling okay uh, we what we do is in horizontal scaling we automatically scale up by adding or reducing computing nodes okay say for instance one single node or in in a scenario like uh, in containerization think uh, one single container that is run okay there is one single container running and that container can handle 100 users, okay? So if we add another container or if we add another node, we call those, normally we call those things as nodes, another worker node. What will happen is the secondary node can handle uh, another 100 users, okay? Not the, um, not the, the capacity goal, the scaling happens. So by adding another node, what we can do is we can uh, we can have more uh, workload uh, balanced okay so add in three four five whatever the uh, number of nodes that you can add to the system then it will automatically be allowed to uh, manage the uh, application to scale up so that what we call horizontal scaling okay then the next scaling type uh, which we uh, comes in is what we call uh, 
what we call uh, is vertical scaling. Okay. Um, <laughs> vertical scaling in 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 a nutshell is not not by adding um, not by adding any uh, worker nodes by but what we have say for instance we have one single knot we will be scaling up the single knot that we have say for example uh, we have a knot um, which has one GB of memory, one CPU, this kind of thing. So by introducing vertical scaling, what we will do is we will make it um, four GB of RAM and eight, uh, eight CPUs. So that is what we call uh, vertical scaling. Okay. So we scale up the performance of the current node. Okay. So horizontal scaling, we add more nodes. Typically, when we are working with um, horizontal scaling, the nodes tend to be equally in resources. Say, for example, uh, we have one node with one GB of RAM and one CPU. Okay. So if you're adding another node, basically the node, the copy node or the uh, node that we're going to add, it's going to be the same uh, resources. So one GB of RAM and uh, uh, sorry, one GB of RAM, one GB of CPU. So most of the time, it, 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 there is no rule that it says all the nodes should be identical. Okay, that is, there is no rule, but uh, for easy management and easy um, uh, reference, what we do is when we are adding those things, we will uh, be adding something like uh, similar nodes, okay? So we don't have to worry about um, so we don't have to worry about uh, scaling um, adding those things uh, by different specs okay all those things can be same. A contrast to vertical scaling in in vertical scaling what we do is we upgrade our existing node okay so rather than having one GB of RAM we maybe make it eight GB okay. So rather than having one CPU, we can have eight CPUs. So that will make, uh, we can approximately think it would make like eight times faster, but it's not gonna be the, always the case. But we can assume that it would make uh, the application work faster, okay? So either way, uh, what, we, what we are doing is scaling up the application, all right? So let's see uh, how we can scale up uh, one of our applications, one of our applications which is running on a Docker container and how we can scale it up, okay? So uh, in this section, I'm not gonna be going uh, into theory part like we did in uh, Docker and all those stuff. The main reason that I am not going uh, with uh, hands-on experience in this section. We'll be covering only the theory part. Main reason is uh, running um, this kind of software, uh, like what we call in, we will be looking at uh, a software called Kubernetes. It is resource consuming, okay? Uh, when you are working in uh, application, uh, something, uh, some, some uh, application like that, uh, it's not gonna be uh, easy kind of thing or it's not going to be um, what we call uh, um, like even running docker sometimes we need uh, special hardware uh, but in kubernetes it's even more okay so what we will do is we will look at how kubernetes is handling this kind of thing how we can manage those kind of thing and if you are able to do those things, uh, make sure you guys uh, 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 make sure you guys have um, Kubernetes installed. Then you guys can follow it up. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's okay if you guys just learn these things. And but remember, you have to have the knowledge on these things. Otherwise, what will happen is it it won't make any sense to you guys. Okay, so I think um, you guys can see my screen. I just share, shared it. So uh, the first thing that we need to do, uh, we need to uh, know about
about uh, the concepts uh, concepts behind kubernetes okay what be the purpose of uh, kubernetes okay so uh, let me go to the concept overview section so uh, um, so you guys can see where we have a traditional deployment okay uh, we have the applications, different applications such as, um, say for instance, uh, a single uh, app that is uh, running on your machine, which run on top of your operating system, and which will be run running on top of your hard uh, hardware. Okay. So uh, then we have a thing like uh, virtualized deployment. So this is uh, what we call. Uh, virtual machines, this kind of thing. Okay, so in in that scenario, what we have is the hardware and the operating system are, are, are going to be there. This is for the operation of the underlying hardware. Then what we have something called a hypervisor. So it's like the virtualization environment that is going to help us. So um, on top of hypervisor, you have virtual machines. So there are two virtual machines in here. Okay, so in, to, uh, in these two uh, virtual machines, you will have a separate operating system for that. Okay, so there is a, a separate operating system and the virtual machine, the next virtual machine would have its own operating system. So this is like the host operating system. We call this one as the guest operating system. So, so this works. Um, uh, this works in virtualization softwares and on top of that we have uh, binaries and libraries where it is like the runtime equivalent for the application and we have on top of that we can run applications okay so this is like the uh, this is like the um, deployment strategy if you are using virtualization okay then uh, we looked in containerization so it is kind of the uh, similar approach uh, that we have, uh, but um, the difference in here is that uh, rather than having the hypervisor, uh, we have a containerized uh, um, uh, we have uh, we have a containerized runtime. Okay, so this is like what we call the Docker runtime. Okay, the Docker daemon and everything. Uh, it's it's gonna be the simplest. Um, it is it's gonna be the simplest mapping as what we uh, see in uh, what we see in the uh, uh, what we call uh, the virtualization. So it is like the similar layer. But only different is uh, rather than a virtual machine, we have a containerized application. Uh, so uh, in containerized applications, um, containerized application, we do not have an operating system on top of it. So this is the main difference between the uh, virtualization and containerization. We have the uh, binaries on top of it. So you you might ask, okay, if uh, if the operating system is not there, if the operating system is no longer there, how are we gonna run this application? So in in contrast to virtualization, we share the host operating system, some part of the host operating system. So that's why there is no operating system in inside the container but binaries and libraries which is needed the base you can share from the operating system that we have underlined okay so some part of it it's going to be uh, shared not everything but the uh, in a containerized environment you guys can see that the operating system is shared among the container okay unlike the virtual, virtual operating system. Uh, and one other thing to notice is that uh, when we are deploying an application in containerization, we normally don't deploy uh, two application within one single container. That is 
you can do it, but uh, it uh, it it uh, it will make things more complicated when we are deployed. So, for example, if you guys can remember, uh, when we are uh, when we when we deployed uh, the uh, when we deployed our sample web application. Uh, we had a Postgres instance, right? The Postgres instance where it is running the Postgres database. And we had our Node.js application, which is running on another container. And we had the PG admin where we can connect to our uh, connect to our Postgres instance and uh, look around it in a different container. So rather than uh, running all those three services in one single container. What we do is we have a container that uh, we have separate containers for each of these service. So in that manner, what we what we can do is we don't we do not need to uh, run everything. Uh, we do not need to run everything uh, in a uh, single container, but three containers that would make things um, way more easier. Uh, okay. Um, so this is like what we have discussed so far. And uh, you guys can read about these things in the more, uh, more, uh, more um, in detail versions okay so uh, so we have the application deployment and everything so we we might ask okay why then uh, the kubernetes kubernetes and everything is coming to a place what's the main reason uh, that we need uh, kubernetes and what sort of problem it is trying to resolve so let's go in the uh, in the uh, um, application itself. So let's look at the definition in here as well. So you guys can see uh, containers are a good way to bundle and run your application. That is true. So we have when we have uh, containers, what we can do is we can have that container to bundle our application. So we bundled up uh, the application. Uh, we bundle up the application uh, for the uh, for the Node.js application, and it works, right? It is working as normal expected. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, once it is bundled up, uh, we can run the application. Uh, uh, once we have bundled the application, um, we can run it. That's that's fine. Uh, but let's see. In production environment, you need to manage the containers that runs the application. Ensure that there are no downtimes. Okay, that is one one important thing. So, for example, while we are running our application in production, okay, that's uh, that's where all the applications gonna end up. When we running in the production, we need to uh, make sure uh, uh, we need to uh, make sure uh, uh, we need to make sure the product in production. This is uh, the containers that we are running is uh, is not failing. Okay, it is working as expected. Uh, so what we can do uh, uh, to make sure the containers, uh, uh, the containers that we are running is make uh, is not failing. Okay, it's it's not uh, going down all the time. Uh, so. Uh, Say for instance, due to a memory issue, one of the containers is going down. Okay, the memory uh, me memory issue happened within the container it's, itself. Uh, it's it's going down. Now all of a sudden, uh, 
uh, we need to make sure uh, that container is up and running. Otherwise, what will happen is if the container is not running, uh, the service would go down. The service is no longer running, so it will go down. So uh, what we need in, in this scenario, uh, what we need in this uh, uh, section is that uh, we need to make sure somebody or some program at least uh, working uh, to make sure our containers are running without an issue. Okay, our containers are running without an issue. So uh, we don't have a downtime uh, as we expected. Okay, so for example, um, if the uh, if the uh, containers go down, another container need to start, right? So for example, uh, one uh, bad container has a memory issue. Since that memory issue is happening, uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, that another um, container is starting up okay that uh, we do not fail our system all the time that we that we are uh, not working okay so one container goes down another container need to start okay so that we make, make sure okay there are like uh, five minutes or like let's say 30 seconds of delay but at least after 30 seconds, the system is working again. Okay. So how are we going to make sure uh, the system is uh, not, um, not, uh, not, uh, uh, not uh, going down or the system is working as full time. Okay. So in, in, in this scenario, what we can do is uh, we call uh, these kind of tools as orchestration tools okay so we have containerization tools then we have tools like orchestrations so in orchestrations uh, what will happen is um, um, uh, in orchestration what happens is uh, they will uh, work okay they will work as a uh, monitoring tool okay it's not completely a monitoring tool okay it's not like it's only job is monitoring but a kubernetes have um, a way of making sure the system is running all this okay the system is running all the time when we need it okay so kubernetes help uh, with the, with the task of running the application continuously okay so it's a framework that provide to run distributed risk systems okay distributed system resiliently that mean uh, to make sure our application runs always we need to make sure uh, a tool who is watching okay making sure that our system is running perfectly okay so one of you might has okay since kubernetes is also another program kubernetes is also um, a running program that, uh, that it's it's also a program that's run on the machine or somewhere so the problem arise um, what happens if kubernetes is down okay yeah that is also possible right so if Kubernetes uh, is down, who is going to monitor? Okay, so for some reason Kubernetes is also down. Now uh, it won't work as expected. So uh, in a scenario like that, uh, uh, a typical uh, solution or typical manner of doing is something what we call a cluster. Okay, we use uh, the uh, term a cluster so what do we uh, what do we mean by a cluster so in a cluster what we do is uh, um, in a cluster what we do is we do not rely on one single machine okay we do not rely on one single machine so we we have more than one machine that works uh, within our cluster 
Okay, so one of the machines goes down, another machine can take in. Okay, so at least within a cluster, uh, the minimum requirement for a cluster is to have three deployments, three machines to be working, uh, working in our application. So how are we gonna ma make sure that is there? So in Kubernetes, we have, uh, we call these things nodes, okay? So we can have uh, one main node and two worker nodes, okay? So first thing is one main node, another one is two worker nodes. So the, the uh, job of a main node is to make sure the worker nodes are working without an issue. Say for example, one worker node goes down, then what will happen is um, another worker node will take that place. Okay, so uh, even if something uh, something like that happens, okay, say for instance one worker node went down, then Kubernetes is smart enough, the main node is smart enough to notify someone or somebody saying, hey, one of the worker node is down, make sure it is working again. Otherwise, you will be running on one single node that is not good on sometimes. So make sure to at least have two worker nodes. If we have more worker nodes, that is fine. Uh, two is the minimum amount. So make sure we have two worker nodes running so we don't fail over, okay? So within those nodes, okay? So, so I'm talking about um, Kubernetes nodes. So within those two nodes, we can run our containers, okay? So the containers will be running on one or either one of these two nodes, okay? So Kubernetes makes sure by having, uh, by having uh, three nodes that Kubernetes is running and within Kubernetes, the Docker containers are running without an issue. So you might think, okay, that uh, that is like quite expensive, right? It should be because we are running three nodes and those three nodes would come in come with a cost okay the cost of running the application the cost of uh, running this uh, running all these things it's going to be there why uh, three running three nodes is equal to running three new machines okay we 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 will be running like three machines in order to may, uh, make this happen okay so we have three worker nodes uh, running so that means three machines are running to get this done uh, so that that comes with a cost so we we as the developer or the program manager or someone who is deploying this application should know about the cost that involves within this kind of setup it is not going to be cheap it is not going to be simple but it's it's gonna run the business in a smooth way, okay? If you if you if you do not value or if you do not care about okay a downtime of ten minutes or thirteen minutes, then uh, then this application structure might not be for you, okay? If you if if you can tolerate for ten minutes uh, without the service going uh, without service working for ten minutes, if you can tolerate that much then Kubernetes would not be the best solution that you need. But if your application is mission critical and uh, 10 minutes is like losing, uh, losing a lot of money, then it is better to make sure your application is running all the time rather than losing millions of or uh, millions of users or something like that. Say for example, within a hospital system, okay, within a hospital system, uh, there is, uh, for some reason, let's assume, okay, uh, we'll assume that the number of uh, patients coming in is going, uh, going up, okay, and the hospital system might be overwhelming. It is used to handle 100 patients uh, per hour, but due to high demand, um, the number of patients coming is like 
three or four times higher than usual. So what will happen uh, if the system goes down at, at, at a scenario like that? Okay, they're talking about sometimes human life in here. So if 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 you do if you do not get a proper way a proper way to handle this application handle the uh, work load, then what will happen is uh, there can be casualties human life kind of casualties going to be there. Okay, so in order to avoid those things, in order to make sure that is uh, that is not happening, what we need to do is we need to make sure that the uh, system is running always okay how many pa patients are coming in coming down how many operations going within that we need to make sure uh, the application works as uh, as it is okay so we can't wait 10 minutes okay if if, uh, if that can be a life threatening situation uh, the 10 minutes might be a life or death situation so we we can't uh, rely on uh, broken systems okay so in in a scenario like that of course we can uh, we should deploy our application more robust more uh, uh, resilient way so kubernetes might help with something like that but if it is not mission critical if we can wait for 10 minutes uh, if we can wait until the server is start then this is what we call a overkill. And we don't need a server that is costing us millions of dollars, but the uh, application, uh, the people who are using is like uh, generating a few, uh, a few couple of hundred uh, rupees, okay? So we have to make sure the balance is there. We know what we are doing and uh, we need to know we are to use what? Okay, as I mentioned earlier, this is like the high end uh, uh, high end case where we we need to work on. Okay, we we need to make sure that this is uh, the um, case where um, uh, this is the case where we we are working um, the uh, the system that we are running is highly highly resilient okay it's it should not go down for a second kind of thing if you have if you need uh, that kind of thing then you are in for kubernetes otherwise this is useless okay all right um so <laughs> we know uh what's uh what's there um yeah uh, so we know what Kubernetes is <laughs> sorry, uh, capable of. Okay, Kubernetes is capable of doing these things. Uh, it's it's gonna make the application resilient. So how it's gonna make that um, that's happen? Okay, the first uh, set of features uh, that Kubernetes provide is like. Uh, these um these um services what we call or these uh, um these kind of facilities kubernetes provide us okay so uh, we we uh, uh we can leverage these um services which is provided by kubernetes in order to get um get the best case or the use uh, the best use case of our application so what we need to do in this scenario uh, is to explore these things okay we would not be using everything uh, that kubernetes offers and sometimes you might uh, um you might not uh, uh, uh Uh, you might not uh, uh, you might not uh, uh, even use these things but it's better uh, uh, it's 
is these things you should know at least these are uh, there okay uh, the first thing is uh, service discovery and load balancing okay so service discovery is uh, what we call uh, um, when uh, uh, when we're talking about um, horizontal scaling when we uh, talk about uh, application uh, applications running in uh, multiple um, multiple instance uh, we need uh, something called service discovery that means uh, as i mentioned earlier in horizontal scaling what we do is we will we will not be scaling uh, the uh, performance of the application or the uh, what we call the application uh, or the nodes uh, performance like ram and uh, virtual uh, so, yeah, ram and cpus we will be cloning nodes okay so in a scenario like that in a um in uh, in uh, in a situation like that we will be scaling nodes okay say we have clones of our application uh, maybe two or three containers running uh, running uh, running within our application so it's going to be the same application cloned upon okay so we we have several nodes which runs the same application which is uh, which is how we achieve scale so in a scenario like that how many nodes are running okay how many nodes are currently running within the horizontal scaling say for example it might be running one node it might be running two nodes three we don't know how many nodes are running okay we need to make sure that the number of nodes that we are running is known to us and uh, when the uh, when when the traffic is coming when the when there are a lot of traffics coming in we need to make sure uh, or we know okay there are seven instances or seven nodes of the application um, so in uh, in terms of that in terms of uh, checking um, checking with the uh, checking with the application um, uh, we need to make sure we identify what are the nodes available okay we need to make sure that nodes are available there and uh, those nodes are known to the kubernetes system so we have something called service discovery to know what are these what are the nodes that is currently running and the next thing is load balancing okay we have several nodes which is running uh, but we need to make sure uh, not all the traffic is coming to one single node there are a couple of clones a couple of uh, copies of that node we need to make sure the the request the load that is coming is balanced or evened out between those nodes say for example if we have two nodes then we need to make sure the two nodes are getting equal or at least somewhat uh, equally distributed the load balance okay so if one request goes to uh, node a the second request should go to node b so we know that both of these requests uh, or the uh, both of these nodes are utilized correctly this is what we call a load balancing in nutshell. There are like load balancing algorithms. We're not going to be talking about those things. At least we need to make sure uh, using some sort of algorithm or not, we need to make sure all the nodes, all the services that we have, they are working as, um, as much efficient as they can be by distributing the load itself. Okay. So load balancing and service discovery is built into Kubernetes to make sure, okay, we have this amount of node and we have this amount of requests coming and we need to make sure these nodes are getting the similar workload so they do not get stopped, okay? So that is one thing that we need to make sure uh, that is uh, that is happening or that is actually handled by Kubernetes itself. And 
Uh, and the next thing that we need to do is storage orchestration. Okay, so storage orchestration in in a sense uh, where um, where we have uh, uh, you know when we are storing data, it's not always going to be a database. Okay, sometimes we have uh, way more advanced or way more uh, uh, way more uh, different type of uh, data to be served. For example. Um, uh, for example, we, we might need uh, something like, uh, we need something like uh, uh, images or sounds to be, uh, um, to be uh, uh, shown or to be stored in our application. In a scenario like that, we need uh, external storage. Uh, we need uh, some sort of um, like hard disk kind of thing to uh, accept and store these uh, messages uh, or store these files. So we can have storage orchestration uh, in, in our application in order to uh, make sure that uh, uh, that the uh, files that we are storing is uh, uh, separate from the service that we are running. So let me give an example. Why do we need storage management? Uh, one of the reasons storage management is important. Say for example, uh, we have a container. Uh, we have a container that is running a database. Okay. So even in a database, the data is going to be stored somewhere, right? It's not going to be in a RAM or something like that. It's going to be saved in a hard disk or somewhere, okay? Say, for instance, the node goes down, uh, the container goes down. Then what will happen? Uh, our application will crash, okay? The data will be lost, okay? If the container crash alongside that container, everything that was in there, the container itself and the storage will be gone. Okay, so there is no way that we can recover those values. So if you guys can remember, we talked uh, the same kind of uh, situ uh, same kind of concept in Docker as well. You guys can remember Docker volumes. So rather than uh, we sharing all the application things within the container itself, what we do is we uh, store these things. We store the application. Uh, uh, we we uh, we uh, what we do is we uh, uh, we store these uh, documents or store the files within the external uh, section. So we do not uh, get into uh, 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 what, uh, what, what, uh, um, um, uh, what we are, what we are storing in, in this uh, application, it's going to be com uh, the, the files that we are going to be storing in a completely new location. So that's why storage orchestration is necessary. So one node goes down. We don't go down with all the data. We at least have the data backup somewhere else. If another node comes in, we plug that uh, stored data into that node. So we can assume that at least some of the data is not corrupted and uh, saved in, 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 in our uh, application without an issue. Okay, uh, right. Um, so, uh, what we're going to do is, uh, we will see these things and we will uh, discuss these things, but not seen in action, but have the, uh, uh, have the, um, knowledge or have, uh, the, um, idea that is, this is something related or something similar to Docker volumes. Okay. 
All right. Uh, the next thing is automated rollouts and rollbacks. That means, um, you know, when we are deploying applications, we are not deploying the application um, as uh, what we call, uh, sorry, uh, we are not deploying the application as um, uh, what do you call um, a sudden blast. Okay, so when we are deploying an application, when we are uh, rolling out something that we, I mean, let's say for example, we have added a new feature, and that feature is need to uh, go smoothly with the existing system as well. So in a scenario like that. How are we going to handle the rollouts? Okay, how are we going to handle the rollouts? Uh, say, for example, uh, we have introduced a uh, new, um, uh, new feature, but uh, rather than giving the feature to everyone, okay, we, we, we do not uh, give the feature to everyone at, at, at a glance. What we do need to do is we will roll out, we will um, give the update for certain amount of people, okay? Uh, let's say uh, we have uh, from the system itself, we are not going to deploy this for each and everyone, but for like 30% of the application users, we will give this a new update, okay? So we can make sure uh, the 70% of the application uh, application users are working with the old version and 30% of our, our users will be working with the uh, new version, okay? So, uh, in that scenario, what we can do is, uh, okay, we can monitor whether the 30% which received the new update is getting any errors okay are they getting any errors and uh, um, are they getting any errors or are they having any troubles if they do not find any troubles let's say for example ah, okay uh, the new feature seems to be fine there is no issues with that what we can do is we can uh, have a clarification or we can have uh, uh, um, um I, I, uh, we can have the clarification on that oh, okay the third the the 30 percent who have tested the application is working fine okay that means our deployment is going okay so we don't have to worry about uh, that much then rather than going 100 percent at all what we're going to do is okay now we have tested our application with 30 percent now we'll make it like 60%, okay? So what will happen is the 60% of our uh, users who is coming to our uh, service will get the new version. 40% uh, of them will not get that uh, version, okay? So while we, while we are testing on the 60%, okay, uh, something unexpected happened. Say for example, uh, an unknown bug or unknown uh, use case has pop up with some of the users. And now what will happen is our application is not uh, working as expected for the, um, uh, the application is not working as expected for the, uh, for uh, the new, newly introduced 30%. Okay. So what will, what we can do is we can we, we certainly we can't go ahead right because it's like uh, it's like a uh, blocking thing maybe a critical bug okay that we haven't encountered before for the thirty percent it doesn't uh, did did not occur but for the sixty percent now a critical bug is popping up so in a scenario like that uh, uh, in a scenario like that. What will happen is uh, uh, in a crit in a critical scenario like that, what we can do is we can roll back. Okay, so roll out means we are giving the update. Roll back in the sense we are uh, 
we are uh, going uh, going back. That means, okay, we say, okay, the new update have a bug. We are not gonna proceed for the full roll back, roll out. We will roll back. That means we can, uh, we can get it back. We can uh, we can undo what we have done, and we can go to the older version, which we which we think it is like working perfectly. Okay, so uh, what we can uh, what we can do in this scenario is rolling back would make uh, the application the rolling back feature would uh, make uh, make a use ton of you uh, ton of uh, useful things like we don't uh, we don't uh, uh, we do not uh, 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 we do not um, go ahead with the update we will roll back once the application is uh, once the application is stable once we uh, figure out ah, okay this is the issue we need to fix and then redeploy again we can go uh, in a rollout fashion rather than going all the way to 100 percent first we will like 30 percent if everyone is okay we can go to 60 percent if the 60 percent is working then we might go to 100 percent okay so uh, at any time, we can roll back to the older version that we had. Okay, we can simply say, okay, the older version did work, so no need to uh, deploy the latest version. We will go back and do it for the older version. So that's kind of thing uh, will be really helpful when you are de deploying application in production level. Okay, in development time, of course, you don't have to worry about development time. You can say, ah, okay, this is a bug. We will fix it. And we go next round of uh, what do you call uh, deployment, and we can go and uh, we, we we don't have to worry about that much. But in a production level application, it is always safe to rather than going with the bug, we roll back and fix it and roll roll out again. Okay, that is kind of a common pattern that we will see in uh, in uh, application deployment. Okay. So uh, there are uh, uh, there are um, special mechanisms uh, on on built built on top of this like deployment strategies what we call uh, which which is like helping out with the automated rollbacks like there are like canary releases there is like blue green releases so you guys uh, do uh, research on that how we gonna do uh, these kind of releases, but what I explain is like pretty normal standard way of doing it. But uh, certain uh, programs or certain deployments, we use uh, things like uh, blue green deployments, like we discussed, and we have canary release, this kind of thing. So make sure you guys check those things out as well. Okay. All right. Um, and um, uh, one of the uh, Automatic bin packing, okay. So automatic bin packing is it's like, uh, it is like, uh, um, you know, the nodes have limits. Uh, we when we're talking about Kubernetes node, the Kubernetes nodes have limits. Say for example, uh, it might have eight GB of RAM, this amount of money, this amount of RAM, and this amount of memory. So when we are working with automatic bin packaging, what will happen is it will utilize the node that is um, that uh, that will uh, that will full fit the containers that you are running. Okay, so it is like not overkilling everything. It will make sure the application is running uh, with the given resources for that node. Okay, that's kind of the basic idea around it. Okay. So let's move on. Um, the self-healing uh, mechanism, that means, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for some reason, if the container is restarting, okay, a container that we have is not responding as we expected. It is giving a lot of uh, issues. It restarts constantly. Sometimes it is not working. Um, not working, it is killing. Sometimes it is overheating, and uh, sorry, overloading. 
then um, self healing mechanism comes in it will uh, it will do some uh, things depending on the uh, solo, depending on our deployment so for example we can say uh, if a container okay if a container restart more than five times then we should look at it uh, manually because a container should not restart uh, uh, container should not restart always. That means the container is struggling to start. Okay, uh, at a uh, at a starting point, it is not working. Then it is like giving uh, huge issues. So we need to make sure it is not struggling and it is working as expected. Um, when uh, when uh, when a container is not running, okay. So we need to make sure, okay, we can manually fix this. Sometimes there will be a database connection, this kind of issues. So we need to make sure those things are monitored. If not, what we need to do is uh, we, we might, uh, uh, we need, uh, say for example, a container is not responding. Container is not giving us uh, any uh, information. It is there, but it is not uh, taking any uh, so it is not uh, responding to the Kubernetes system. Then what we need to do is we need to replace that container and deploy a new one. Because if a container is like a ghost, that means it doesn't respond or it doesn't do anything. It's just simply they are uh, eating our resources. So we need to make sure that kind of thing is not happening. We need to make sure um, the resources are kept in a line and if a uh, container is not working we need to remove it and deploy a new one okay so we need to make sure constantly the containers are running healthy okay so the the helps help healing mechanism with kubernetes kicks in and uh, help us to uh, make sure our application is running smoothly okay and uh, the next thing uh, this is one of the most important thing that uh, uh, you would see. Uh, 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 the most important thing is uh, secret and configuration management. Okay, so secret and configuration management is uh, like. Uh, uh, so, um, in secret and configuration management is, uh, uh, is like the, um, uh, is like, um, uh, so for example, we, we, in Docker, uh, Docker, uh, application when we are running docker application we use something like uh, environment variables right you guys can remember the environment variables that we use uh, then we use those things inside our um, container itself say for example within our node.js application we use the database connectivity sometimes we use database password and username those kind of things so when we want to use uh, such application, when we want to use uh, such scenarios, what we can do is we can come to this configuration and secret management. So rather than providing uh, the uh, environment variables, okay. So when uh, when we are running the Docker environment uh, in Docker Compose or Docker Run command, we were able to give the uh, we were able to give the uh, uh, we were able to give it uh, we were able to give uh, so we were able to pass those things as environment variables but in 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 application uh, that is uh, that is like um, scaling up and we need to store these configurations somewhere then what we can do is uh, there is a separate section in Kubernetes called configuration management 
where we can say okay when we are working with the uh, we are, when we are working with this container make sure to uh, use this environment variables or this configuration uh, to your uh, runtime or deployment time so we don't have to provide them manually uh, with the docker run command okay so uh, let uh, I, I will show you guys some uh, configuration management and secret management uh, on next uh, next lecture when we uh, when we try to deploy a simple Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so you uh, you guys will see what I'm talking about. So the configuration management those are like simple things like uh, uh, database connection and all those things. Sometimes uh, some uh, not confidential informations like. Uh, um, um uh like the things um and uh sensitive non non sensitive information comes into place like the urls uh, that is publicly available sometimes um database name those kind of things can be a configuration management but there are things like secret very super secret that we need to keep uh, like for example a database password database username so those things are things very sensitive okay you you can't share those things uh, uh, you can't share those things in uh, open public okay you can't show those things to some uh, some people even within the system okay? you need to make sure those things keep uh, or stay in the secret so we have a separate section in our application in our uh, uh, in in our section which we call a secret okay so passwords uh, ssh keys tokens those kind of things are stored in a secret section anything that is not sensitive we can put those things in configuration management okay so we'll see how these things uh, are helping us so especially when we are running a container, okay, we need to pass this configuration to our container in order to start up. Okay, uh, if you guys can remember, we use something like environment variables. So this is like pretty much similar to that. Uh, we can use those things in here. So secret and configuration management is also a feature that is coming from Kubernetes that help us to run a container. Okay, so basically these things we we uh, when we're running Docker com uh, Docker uh, containers, we might have used these things. For example, the secret and configuration management we have used uh, using environment variables, uh, storage orchestration we have used uh, something like uh, storage orchestration we have used something like. Uh, uh, uh sorry uh, the storage option is uh, uh storage option is something like a volume so uh, kubernetes does not provide like uh just provide some existing features which is enhanced and there are like new features like the service discovery and load balancing, which is not available in Docker. Okay, these are like a service that Kubernetes provides. It is building on top of that. Um, and other things like uh, badge execution. This is something uh, uh, that we can do in Kubernetes. Uh, for example, if we if you have a uh, if you have something that runs uh, one time, okay, uh, say for example, we, we want to uh, create a backup of our database, okay, we, we, uh, we are running a database backup, so that is like a badge execution that we can do, uh, create uh, this, uh, this kind of, sorry, actually the, the backup is not a good uh, example in here. Uh, uh, um, so uh, backup 
uh, ID e, uh, sorry backup uh, uh, is not good thing but let me get uh, what do you mean by batch execution okay that in batch execution uh, something like um, uh, we can consider like um, applying a uh, um, applying uh, a database migration okay or some sort of uh, some sort of task which will be executing several times okay uh, but it is not a one time job but it's going to run for a long time okay then we can use batch execution in this scenario okay i i'll try to some, demonstrate some of these uh, concept in here but in uh, if, if, if we did not have time or if i uh, if we over, overstep so what we will do is we'll just have a remember um, that um, uh, batch execution is is like running for a long time and getting things done okay so that is batch execution so we talked about horizontal scaling in detail horizontal scaling is basically uh, if you are running out of resources, we will add more nodes and those nodes will work as expected. Okay. So um, these things uh, like IPv4, v6, v uh, dual stack, to be honest, I am not quite familiar with these terms. Uh, so these are like more into a networking kind of thing. So if you are really interested in networking and how these things work, Please uh, have a look around it. To be honest, I I don't have like a big idea on these things, what it means, okay? Um, so these are like the uh, things that Kubernetes provide beside what we have on top of Docker, okay? So we need to make sure that this is the things uh, that the application uh, or the Kubernetes application provide. So we need to make sure we know what are, what is a node, what is the main node, how Kubernetes is managing uh, uh, clustering and all those things. Okay, um, anything that you guys need, uh, uh, need, uh, what do you call, um, yeah, any things that you need more ideas on or you need more explanation? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. If not, um, we will just go with uh, basic Kubernetes. Okay. So you don't have, uh, uh, you don't have to like uh, learn everything, but have an idea about all those things. Uh, uh, make sure uh, you know these uh, fundamental things. Otherwise, uh, what will happen is you will get uh, some um, some things uh, which which will not make more sense. Okay. Uh, so one thing that I need to highlight uh, that is. Um, um, that is the use of uh, uh, give me a second so, um, uh, the, the most important thing that we need to uh, look around here is um uh, in here is uh um uh, so in in here what we uh, what we need to know is how we can run this thing so as i mentioned earlier running a kubernetes cluster is not uh, like uh, really a cheap thing to do 
okay it's, it's not going to be uh, really um, uh, what do we call a really um, uh, simple uh, simple one or simple task but we can't test these things in live environment it's going to cost us a lot okay so in order to make sure okay we need to test these things whether we uh, whether before we go into production we need to make sure our kubernetes cluster is working whether the deployments are working so there should be a way that as developers we need to make sure that these things are working not in the grand scale but at least a simple scale where these applications are working as expected. So in order to test those things, the best place or the best thing that you can do is uh, have something like Minikube, okay? So Kubernetes have this, um, have this uh, tool, which is what we uh, call a Minikube. The Minikube objective is uh, uh, Minikube objective is that you can run uh, you can run your uh, Kubernetes cluster within uh, your local machine. Okay, so you don't have to run this in uh, in somewhere else, uh, somewhere like uh, somewhere like a, a real cluster which we set up in the cloud. What we can do is we can uh, set up a mini cube uh, set up in our local machine and we can test those things out. Okay, see this is uh, like the development uh, development area. So if you, if you really want to get started rather than uh, having a huge cluster which all, which with, through uh, which three nodes and everything, uh, it's better to start things with Minikube because this, this is like the local version where you can write, uh, we, you can uh, you can um, test out Kubernetes in theory, okay? And be aware, this needs more resources than what we have for Docker. So make sure you have a good amount of, uh, a good amount of resources to run this application, okay? Minikube is the one that you are looking for. So basically uh, ex ex executing Minikube start, it will uh, start a Kubernetes cluster for you. Okay, it's, it's, it's that easy. And uh, there is a Minikube dashboard, which will open the dashboard uh, software for you, which we'll look in the next section. So we can, uh, we can see, uh, in a, a GUI way, what we have talked so far, like the storage management, service management, replication management, all those things have nice UI that we can try upon. So Minikube has it's built on dashboard section. So if you write, if you if you call Minikube dashboard, it will give us a nice UI to interact with. Okay, and one other thing uh, that we need to know is uh, 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 what we need to know is the uh, um, a tool called cube cuddle okay so, so most of the, uh, most of the time you might hear this as cube control cube cuddle so whatever it is uh, the cube cuddle or cube control is a tool uh, or uh, 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 what we call um, CLI tool, which help us to manage our cluster. Okay, so we have the Kubernetes cluster. We can control that cluster, okay, rather than the uh, GUI, if you, if you do not like the GUI itself. Most of the time, the things that we need to do is going to be handled by the um, Kubernetes uh, uh, cube cuddle or cube controller which will help us to uh, manage our cluster okay so minikube is the software that help us to run kubernetes in local and cube cuddle is one of the uh, tools or uh, applications which we can control that cluster 
uh, uh, and interact with it. Okay, so cube cutter is a tool or cube control is a tool which we can even control mini cube itself. Okay, or even Kubernetes itself. Okay, Kubernetes, mini cube, whatever. The cube control will help us to control the cluster that we are having. And uh, one other thing that we need to uh, know about how, how to handle these cube uh, cutters and what are the things that we're going to show. But simply, we will we will uh, have a lot of things to go in here. We will not uh, we will not go through these all the things that we need to need to show. But have some information how we can uh, how we can deploy a container, how we can deploy a service. That kind of thing we will be briefly looking at. Okay, not even. Uh, looking in much detail, I'll just show you guys how we can deploy uh, a simple container using Minikube. Uh, that's it. Okay, nothing major. Uh, so if you are really interested in uh, deployment management and uh, those kind of things, uh, you can go further down the road. But you know, for majority, if you are just scratching the surface or if you want to know just the simple terminologies and have a look around it, you can just go through the simple Kubernetes uh, mini cube setup and everything. Okay. So it's up to you how how deeper that you guys want to go. But uh, from my perspective, I think if you are really not into deployment stuff, CICD pipelines and all those things, I think uh, having the knowledge kubernetes is there and it can do this and that that would be enough you have uh, if you are really passionate if you really need to know you can go ahead with the full tutorials and everything so uh, this is like a place where the deployment uh, is happening and managing okay at at this point there is uh, no other wrapper where you you need to uh, configure uh, things like Kubernetes. So we had Docker. On top of Docker, we have Kubernetes. But apart from that, there, there are no tools at this moment. But who knows? But remember these tools, uh, kubectl or kubectl is one of the uh, applications that we use to uh, that we use to uh, uh, what do you call them? But we use to get the information or uh, handle the application that we have. Um, Give me a second, guys. Okay. So we talked about uh, uh, mini cubes, how you can run. We talked about the concepts. And we will uh, take a look into most of the things uh, in later on. And what else uh, da, 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 da. Uh, the basic concept of kubernetes let me check mm. well basics uh,
So uh, when we are talking in Kubernetes terms, uh, there are things that you should understand. There are things that you you guys uh, should learn. Okay. So we talk about the cluster. Okay. Where we we will be uh, having all those things. Then uh, uh, there are things that you guys need to know. Uh, in terms of uh, having the basics around uh, basics around uh, Kubernetes stuff. So, <laughs> so, so one thing uh, that we should know uh, in terms of Kubernetes is <laughs> sorry, what we call uh pods okay so i'm not gonna go into uh like detailed uh description of what a pod is sorry so in in uh in uh sorry in an action a pod uh, is one of the concept, one of the main concept uh, that we need to know. Okay, so this is one of the most important uh, concepts. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so pods, e, pods are the smallest deployable unit of computing that you can create and manage in Kubernetes. Okay. So, uh, you guys know the containers, right? You know, uh, uh, when we are talking about a thing, uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, Docker, you guys know the uh, container is the deployable uh, section. So, we have images uh, on based on images. We you run a container. So that is like the smallest deployable unit in, in terms of Docker. But in terms of Kubernetes, we do not run Kubernetes in Kubernetes, we do not run containers as it is. So we use something called pods. Okay. So within within side pods, we will be deploying containers. Okay. So one single pod can contain one or more containers okay so that is something that you guys need to know okay that's that's even enough so the uh, if you want to run if you want to deploy something in kubernetes the smallest thing that you would come across is what we call pod and within the pod you will find one or more containers okay so in Docker terms, uh, in Docker world, if you, if you may, uh, we have the smallest deployable unit as a container, but in Kubernetes, we have a pod. So pod is like the smallest uh, thing that you can do. And uh, this is like a pod definition, what we call this is a pod definition. So uh, we, we uh, when we want to deploy something in Kubernetes, we have this uh, deployment files. Okay, this is like something that you would see in Docker. If you guys can remember the uh, Docker Compose, we have something similar, some uh, similar structure like this, but this is uh, uh, what we call a uh, uh, pod definition. Okay, we call this is as a pod definition. So basic things that you need to know that uh, this is the version because we can have multiple version of the pod definition and what kind of uh, resource is this? This is a pod resource. Okay, so this is going to be a pod resource and we can attach some metadata. It's, it's not sometimes mandatory, but labeling is always good. And the next thing is the spec. And we need to, within the spec, we need to define the containers. In this scenario, we have only one container, 
but we can have more than one candidates. As for the first pod definition, we can have multiple pod spots. Okay, in this scenario, we will have one single pod, uh, one single container within this pod. Uh, so we will name the pod as engine X. And what is the image? So this is always going to be a Docker image. Okay, make sure this is some. Uh, uh, this is a Docker image that we have access to. So if uh, by default, by default, uh, it will be looking in uh, Docker Hub. Okay, so we we know the images that we are pulling when we have execute Docker pull command. Those things be coming from uh, Docker Hub itself. In this scenario, it's the same thing. The image that we are uh, giving, Nginx 1.14.2, is going to be something that is pulled from Docker Hub itself. And that is the image that we will be using. So any, uh, any ports that we want to expose, you can have that one as well here. OK, so this is the port definition which contains an Nginx image, okay, only one image, but I, uh, we can have more. And this is a simple pod definition, okay. So in Kubernetes, these are like the common way of defining everything. So if you want to, if I want to deploy a pod within Kubernetes, I need to come up with this pod definition and I need to use the cube control uh cube control um command uh, and use the apply command and give a file path uh, where is the uh, the yml file is located so this is the yml file if i look look in this uh location itself i might find something similar Let's go to the website as it is. I think it is downloading for me. Uh, let me check. Yeah, it's the same content that uh, we see in here. So either I can show a local location where the file is saved, or I can show uh, this kind of uh, place. So what we'll do is using cube control. Cube control is the manager for Kubernetes cluster. Apply this file. What is the file? This file, which is containing the pod definition in here. So once we apply this uh, pod definition, Kubernetes will deploy a pod. Okay, Kubernetes will deploy a single pod. The pod contains one single container. That's it. Okay. So I will demonstrate these things uh, when we go for the next tutorial section. Right now, we need to remember the basic uh, or the base deployment uh, part for, uh, our, for our applications is going to be a pod within Kubernetes. Okay, within Kubernetes. That's that's a highlighted keyword. Uh, so what are the other things that we need to know? Uh, the other things that we need to know is what we call a label. Make sure it's going to show up. So uh, labeling is pretty important. So why labeling is pretty important? Uh, Google have different services. Sorry, Kubernetes have different services, right? Uh, like uh, one thing that we have talked is pod. And there are several other things that we need to talk. Okay. So, uh, especially with services, configuration management, and a lot more. So, all those things, all those uh, different components are communicating. How do we, how do they gonna know we, uh, which to apply what? Uh, 